And in this church, we use amplifier, isn't it? What's the purpose of an amplifier? To amplify the sound so that it can reach out properly. Am I right? So the purpose of this conference is to raise Christ amplifiers in this ministry. Those who shall become the mouthpiece for Jesus Christ. And that is what this conference is all about. And to also let you know the centrality of Jesus as our message. Amen? Jesus is our message. That is why, if, if you come in here, it won't take a long time to discover that the only thing we know here is just Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and nothing more. Praise the Lord. Because he is our what? Message. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. This morning, I'm going to share with you on what I call, uh, how do I put it now? Because there are different ways I can tie through this uh, teaching this morning. Amen? Um, I can call it, Sir, we will see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And my prayer this morning is that Jesus will manifest his power. And you will see him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to come in two, three different ways. First of all, I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever wondered why God called David a man after his own heart? Have you ever thought about that? Now, God said, David is a man after my heart. Why did God love David so much and call him the man after his heart? Why? Some people think that the answer is because he was very quick to repent when he commits sins. You know, that is why God called him a man after his heart. But that's not the reason at all from what I discovered in the Bible. Now, God called David a man after his heart before he committed sin with Bathsheba. So it's not because of his eagerness to repent. Now, God loved David. And knowing David's secret will give you the key to the fullness of God's blessings in your life. Can I hear amen to that? Yeah. There must be something about David that is so important in the heart of God. Do you want to know the secret? Yes, I didn't hear you answer very well. Yes, okay, turn the scriptures to Psalm 132. You will understand why God said David was a man after his heart. Psalm 132. Psalm 132. All right. Can I have it on the screen? Now, the psalm was written when Saul was persecuting David as a king of Israel. Follow me this morning. We're going somewhere very interesting. Verse 1 says, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. That was when he was being afflicted by Saul. You know the story, I guess. I swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. David swore to the Lord and vowed unto the God of Israel. What was the vow and what was he all about? Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids. What was the issue that was so important to David that he said, I will not sleep? I will not go into my house. What was the matter? What was the thing that was in the heart of David until I do something? Now, before I show you what actually it is all about, now look at First Chronicles chapter 28, verse number 4. There's something about David there that you need to hear. First Chronicle 28, verse number 4. Quickly, on the screen. All right. How be it, the Lord God of Israel chose me. That's David talking there. The Lord chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler and of the house of Judah and the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he liked me. Can you imagine? David said, God like me. God, God just loves me. 
And this morning, I think I'm one of the people that God likes most. Do you know, David was a chosen man. He said, I know God, God likes me. Do you know God loves you and likes you? If anybody's here this morning and you feel rejected because of the situation around you, you must understand that God loves you and God likes you. Amen. Say, God likes me. Say, God loves me. Very good. So David said, God likes me. The Hebrew word is called Rasta. And up to today, it's being used in Israel. You know, I Rasta you. That is, I like you. So David said, God liked me. Hallelujah. Why did God like David? Why? What made him a man after his own heart? Now, I believe it's because David touched on something that is so important to God. What is that thing that made God say that David is a man after my heart and I like him? Now, go back to our text since I wanted the truth verse 5. This is the reason I want to show you right now. No, that's our text, 132, Psalm 132, then verse number 5. It says, until I find out a place, listen carefully, until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Israel. Why was David restless? He said, I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't go to my house. He said, until I find a place for the Lord, habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. What does that mean? The next verse. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the field of the wood. Hallelujah. Now, David was talking about something very precious in the heart of God. Now, what was it all about? Look at verse 8. And David said, verse 8, he said, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Hallelujah. David was saying, I will find no rest. I will sleep not in my house until I find a place for the ark of the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, this is why God considered him as a man after his own heart. You know, in the ark of God was out of Jerusalem for me for 20 years, out of the right place. And David said, no, the ark must come back to Jerusalem. The ark must come back to its rightful place. You know, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in between the two cherubims, you know, which are on the ark. You know, the, if you know the picture of the ark, very, very interesting, you know. And that was the throne of God in the days of the Old Testament. You know, when Israel had battles with enemies, they put the ark along with them. And when enemies found out that the ark was there, they were in trouble. Because that ark signified the presence of the Jehovah God. Hallelujah. When they knew that the ark was with them, they trembled. They shook. They knew that the battle was over. Because the God that is inside the ark will fight for Israel. Now, can I say this morning, the greatest um, treasure you have in life is God's presence. When you have God's presence in your life, you have everything in your life. Hallelujah, that's the greatest currency you have. That was the strength of the ark to Israel. But now the ark was no longer at the reach of the Israelite. It was now in another place, not in the right place. Hallelujah. Now let me ask you, in the, the days of Israel, which was the holiest city in Israel? It is called what? Jerusalem. Is that correct? Am I right? All right. Which was the holiest place in Jerusalem? It's called the temple. Right? Good. Which was the place or the holiest place in the temple? It's called the holy of what? Holies. Is that right? Okay. And where is the ark of God placed? It's placed inside where? The holy of what? Holies. Inside the holiest place, in the holiest side temple, the holiest city, David was saying to himself, I will not rest until the ark comes back to the holy of holies. Now, in the Old Testament, God speaks to the priest. For me, between the two cherubims, 
Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. I don't, I don't want to also go into that. That is on the mercy seat. See, the ark has a mercy seat with kind, a kind of uh, two angelic beings with their wings covering that lead, the golden lead, you know. And it's from in between the two cherubim that God communicates with Israel. So the ark shows the presence of God. That's where everything is being controlled from. Hallelujah. And that ark was outside where it's supposed to be. Now, that ark is like a box. For those who don't want to familiar with the ark of the covenant in those days, it's like a box. A box. Rectangular box. On top of it was a golden slab, which has been crushed, you know, and to become a slab. And on top of it were two angelic beings with their hands, and God is sitting between them. Are you following what I'm saying right now? But under the ark are so many things that were covered. Praise the Lord. They were what? They were what? They were what? Covered. Now, if you look at the nature of the ark, the lead was a golden lead. We talked about the divinity of Christ. The wood, the body is wood. I'm talking about humanity. Because Jesus Christ is a perfect God and perfect man. I wouldn't have time to expand it on that. You see, the wood, which is the body, represents humanity. The lead, which is the good, represents divinity. Praise the Lord. As, praise the Lord. So Jesus was completely human and completely divine. Hallelujah. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Let me just quickly make you understand. Now, as I said, the lead was the golden place called the mercy seat. Say mercy seat. Now, what is the mercy seat covering from sight? It's covering three things. Number one, it's covering the tabernacle of, I mean, table of Ten Commandments. Now, if I, let me just summarize. See, inside that ark were things that God doesn't want Israel to see. That's why the lid covered it. One of them is the Ten Commandments which talks about the rebellion of man against God. They call the inability of man to keep law properly, keep it under the earth. Another one was the Aaron's rod that bordered overnight. When God chose Aaron, some people say, no, 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 how do you know he's a leader? We don't want him to be a leader. And there was a contest, you know. Anyway, the rod of Aaron bordered overnight, became fruitful overnight, brought fruit overnight. That shows about man's rebellion against divine leadership. Hallelujah. Then there was also the golden pot of manna. Manna was also there. The Bible calls manna angel's food. Hallelujah. Israel ate the food and in the wilderness, and none of them was sick for 40 years. How many years? And it came to a point, they said, Oh, God, we're tired of this worthless food. They call manna worthless food. And yet, manna is a symbol of Christ. I'm going to show you later what God did to them because of that rebellion. So every item in the ark speaks of our sins and rebellion against God. So, God said, put all of those things inside what? Cover them. I don't want to see them. I will speak with you, and I will deal with you from the mercy seat. From the point of mercy, a place where atonement is made. Glory be to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is, I don't want to see man's sins. I don't want to see yourself, your rebellion. Cover it. Put it under. You see, once in a year in Israel, the high priest will go into the Holy of Holies, offer sacrifice, put the blood upon the, that same place called the, at the table, that's the, the, the mercy seat. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. The mercy seat is talking about nothing but Christ. The mercy seat is talking about who? About Christ. The mercy seat is a place where your sins were atoned for. In First John chapter 2 verse 2, the Bible says that he is our propitiation for our sins. What's the meaning of propitiation? It simply means that, you know, in Septuagint version, and propitiation, they're the same thing. All right? 
It means removal of sin by, I mean, of, of sorry, the removal of rot by the offering of a gift. When God is angry and a gift is presented, the anger of God is diverted. Hallelujah. So Apostle John was saying, Jesus is our message. Hallelujah. So the ark is a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. All our sins have been cleansed because of his blood. That is why it is dangerous for anyone to leave the messy seat, to uncover the messy seat, and say, I want to see what is inside. God doesn't want you to look at that thing inside. There was a city that did it in 1 Samuel. You know about that. Chapter 6, verse 19. The people in that village, they opened the axe. They saw what was inside. God killed many of them. In one day, no one was supposed to even take a peep at the Ten Commandments. God doesn't want to deal with us through the law. He said, all your sins, I'm hiding it. All the iniquities, your rebellion, I put it under the mercy seat. I deal with you from the seat of mercy, the seat of love. God said, don't open that Ten Commandment. You know why? It will minister death and condemnation. Today, people even make posters of Ten Commandments and they hang in their houses. They teach Ten Commandments as the rule of, as the rule of life. But God says, keep it under. Keep it under. Say, keep it under. Hidden under the mercy seat, we should exalt God's mercy, God's grace above law. Mercy trials over judgment. God's grace is above the law. Now, what is all this story I'm telling all about? Bring the ark of the covenant back to the rightful place. And this ark is a symbol of who? Jesus. Let's go back to what David vowed to do, actually. Look at it. Now, for 20 years, the ark has been in a place called Kajat Jarim, which was the field of the woods. Hallelujah. So David had had a about it when he was a young boy, when he was growing, that the ark of God is in Bethlehem, Ephraimite, a place where Jesus was born. Look at Psalm 132, verse 6, to confirm quickly. Now, just to summarize, Psalm 132, verse 6, you see now, and it's smooth. No, Psalm 132, our text, verse 6. Good. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. David, when I was a young boy, I heard of it. We found it in the fields of the woods. Now, the summary of it is this. David brought back the ark. He was wondering, why did King Saul bring back the ark? Nobody cared about the ark. But when he became king, he said, I must bring the ark back to the central place. Now, what am I seeing this morning? Jesus must be brought back to the center of our lives. That is what Christ Amplified is talking about. Let's bring Jesus back to the place that he belongs. To be the central teaching of the church. Focus of the church. In many places today, they teach psychology. How to make money. I don't know how people read their Bibles. Some say they have a calling to be deliverance minister. I don't see that in the Bible. Some say we are called to teach worth. I don't see that in the Bible. There's only one message in the Bible. Just one message. Jesus is a message. From, from Jesus, wealth can proceed. Yeah. From Jesus, healing can proceed. Hallelujah. It's all about unveiling Jesus. So this conference is just te teaching us, let's bring the act back, a symbol of Christ. Let's unveil Jesus. For the world to see. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's reveal Jesus. After all, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, it says, Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So the scepter shall, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Shiloh, not as a place, but Shiloh as a person. 
Forget Shiloh as a place. That's outdated. We're dealing with Shiloh as a person now. Until Shiloh come, and he shall be the one that will be the center of focus of the whole world. Unto him shall the gathering of the people what be. Hallelujah. That is why in Israel, you know, um, they have feasts in Israel, different kinds of feasts every year. And Israel will gather together, you know, come for the feast. But when Jesus, listen carefully, Jesus came to the scene, he began to attend those feasts very privately. Very what? Privately. He was going, and people are what? They've been hearing about Jesus, his miracles, his mighty power. And they'll be asking one another, is he in this conference? Did he come? Because all along the conference was centered on Moses. The teaching of the law. That was the, what the feast of Israel was all about. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? But when Jesus came, he began to attend the church. And his fame began to rise. Can I say, began to change the atmosphere of their feast. Gradually. And little by little, the focus shifted from Moses to who? To Jesus. Shifted from teaching the law, from teaching grace. It, it was a gradual process. In fact, there was one day in John chapter 7, verse 37, put it on the screen quickly, to see that Jesus came and began to transform the Jewish feast from the old to the new order. Are you getting what I'm saying this morning? In the last day, this is Jesus talking in the feast. It was there in that face. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man pass, let him come unto me. And what? And what? Drink. Then the next verse says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. It was changing the focus from Moses to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you imagine in the feast of the Jews? This new man here that just came on board, we heard about him. They say he had disciples, his name is, is Jesus. Now, he made this proclamation at the end of the feast. He said, if any man is starts, wow. I thought they went there to eat. I, I thought it was a feast when after the days have expired, you should have been full, well fed. But law can never feed you. All these teachings about morality, about Moses, it cannot satisfy you. And Jesus knew that it's just a waste of time. He said, if any of you who have been here for this past three days, be eating Moses, eating the law and the commandment, eating behavior modalities and you know, the modification, if you be eating all of this, I know you are still thirsty because I'm the water of life. I'm the bread of life. Your feast is empty without me. So gradually, gradually, the feast face changed his face. Until he got to a point in John chapter 12, verse 20. Look at it. John chapter 12, verse 20, what does he say? And there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. Greeks were unbelievers, seeking to know God. Gentiles, seeking to know the ways of God. They came. They have been coming every year. And they've been hearing about Moses every year. The teaching of the law. You know how to change your morality, how to change your behavior, how to please God with ten commandments. If you don't keep all the commandments, you can never make it. You know, that is what these unbelievers have been hearing over the years. But this time around that Jesus appeared and have been changing the face of the feast, this Greek says something different. What did they say? The next verse. The same Greeks, the same Greeks came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, "Sir, we are tired of these religious teachings. We want to see Jesus. We have been coming for this feast over the years. Our lives are not transformed. We have no peace, no joy. We want to see Jesus. This new man with grace." Is the man we're looking for right now. Unbelievers who came, they said, we are now interested in who? 
They didn't come for religion, they came for reality. The thing that the leaders of religion of their day couldn't see, unbelievers saw it. God, these leaders were blinded by religion. They didn't come for the law of Moses. They came to discover the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And they knew the son has arrived. So the Greek says, sir, we want to see Jesus. Can I say this morning, that should be our desire. To see Jesus. That is Christ amplified. Christ exposed. Christ unveiled. Christ revealed. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus is here right now. Do you believe that this morning? Can I say this very thing this morning? Even the Lord giver himself spoke about Jesus. Moses himself. You know what he said in Acts chapter 3 verse, verse 22? You know, my method this morning is different from what you've been hearing. I'm telling you stories this morning. Praise the Lord, but beautiful story. Are you enjoying my story? Yes, Acts 3, 22. And what does it say? For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord God, your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. In some things, how many things? Whatsoever he shall say unto you. Moses was saying that God will raise a prophet. Another one is the one you must listen to. And you must listen to him in all things. The next verse. What does he say? He said, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. He that believeth shall have life. He that rejects him shall be destroyed. He's condemned already because he has rejected the only Son of God. What, what am I saying here this morning? I'm just saying that even the lawgiver is pointing all of us to what? How many pastors today are pointing us back to the lawgiver? How can law? See, when you know you are a sinner, you sin against God. You broke the law. Normally, the law should drive you to the cross for salvation. Am I right? How can the cross drive you back to the law? It doesn't make any sense. Are you with me here this morning? So Moses himself said, Jesus is the man to listen to. Glory be to God. I say glory be to God this morning. Hallelujah. It shall come to pass. Anyone who does not hear him shall be destroyed. In John chapter 5 verse 46, it says, for ye had, for had ye believed Moses, good, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Say after me, say, Moses wrote about Jesus. One more time, Moses wrote about Jesus. What is Moses? Genesis. What again? Exodus. What again? Leviticus, what again? And what is the last one? So he said, all those books are about me. It's now the duty of every pastor to unveil Jesus in Genesis, Jesus in Leviticus, Jesus in all the other books. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are trying, we're not preaching the Bible. We're preaching the Jesus in the Bible. You know, when I was a young minister, all I need to do is, I'm preaching the total counsel of God. What does that mean? It doesn't mean what you think it means. Preach, you know, Genesis, Revelation, preach any kind of thing. It is easy to preach any message. But it takes discipline, revelation, insight, anointing, calling to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So Moses himself said everything. I wrote this about him. There's only one subject in the Bible. His name is called Jesus Christ. We don't have two messages. It's only one. Only one. That's the meaning of this convention, this conference. That's what it's all about. Hallelujah. It's just about Jesus only. 
Our message is Jesus only. Hallelujah. You know, some people now have taken Jesus, grace message, because grace is not a subject, it's a person. People have taken grace message now as menu before the real meal. Let me show you something that's going to shock you. In Numbers 21, you know, I spoke about this manner. In Numbers 21, verse 5, quickly, please. Verse 5, you know, Israel, Israel, they were in the wilderness. God was giving them this free food, manna, 40 years. And they were never sick. They got tired of this manna. You know what they said? Look at it. And the people speak against God and against Moses. Wherefore, okay, maybe a better version, but let's okay, leave it. Wherefore have you, because all this wherefore, you know what I'm talking about. Where, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Listen carefully. For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And I was so loot this light bread. They call manna light bread. What, what do they call manna? For your information, the manna is a symbol of Christ. It's a type of Christ. I have no time to show you the typologies of Christ in the Old Testament. Moses wrote about Jesus in types, in shadows. You will have no time. That's another subject. But Israel said, this manna is very light. They call it, it's not the real food. It's just the introduction to the real thing. That was why God was angry and he sent serpents to them. Because they despise Jesus. Look at the next verse to, to show you what I'm talking about right now. The next verse says, quickly, please. And so the Lord. I mean, you can't just start a statement with so. Something happened before. What was it? Say, God, this light bread you give to us. You remember that Jesus is the bread of life. Say, this. This light bread you call Jesus, you give to us. We don't want it. We want a real meal. Churches are preaching Jesus as a secondary subject. You know, when you go to a restaurant, you have a starter. Am I right? Uh-huh. Before the main dish will come. In many places, they say, Jesus is just a starter. The law is the real subject. When you preach, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yes, that's the message. You preach, thou shalt not like. Yes, that's the message. We don't preach the law of God. We preach the love of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the gospel is not about the law of God. It's about the love of God. It's about Jesus. Not about sin. Sin is not our subject. Salvation is our subject. <laughs> Hallelujah. So because they call... Man and light bread, God was so angry, he sent serpent to them. And they were dying, and they were dying, and they were dying. Those who reject Christ will die. I cannot help you. And then you know what God did? Now they were, oh, Moses, please help us. Beg God, we're very sorry. We have sinned against God and against you. And please, tell God to take the serpent away. God said, I will not. But what they rejected is what I will force on them. That was why God made that brazen serpent that was lifted up. And God said, if the serpent b- b- bite anyone, look at the, the brazen serpent. You will be healed instantly. Am I right? Yeah. And you know, they wanted to be saved without the Savior. Oh. No. They, they, they were avoiding the manner. And the Lord said, this is the only way for you. So what you are rejecting, I'm bringing it back in another form. Amen. Amen. If you reject the manna, you can't reject. Hallelujah. This man, I want to appeal to you, brethren. Jesus is our life. It's our hope. It's the joy of the nations. It's our Savior. It's the only way to God. Hallelujah. Don't preach Moses, preach Jesus. Don't preach law, preach grace. Hallelujah. You cannot be born by grace and be raised by the law. 
you know, the mentality, hallelujah, the mentality of many, many pastors today is that uh, we agree with it that you are saved by grace. After grace, bring the law. The law will tutor us and the law will shape in our lives. If the law will tell us what to do. How can a man be born by grace and be raised by the law? Does that make any sense at all? What we're doing in standpoint is what Jesus has commissioned us to do. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. What does he say? First Corinthians 2, verse, for I determined, I made up my mind not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him what? So why is church, why are churches going off and on, you know, today? Jesus tomorrow, Moses tomorrow, right? Jesus is the focus, the focus of the church, the central message of the church. That is why here is all Jesus. You heard the song this morning, it's all Jesus. The choir is all Jesus. The preacher is all Jesus. Everything is what? Jesus. Somebody shout, Jesus! You know, if unbelievers can say we're looking for Jesus, how much more you believe? Say we will see Jesus. Say we will see Jesus. Say we will see Jesus. Say we want to see Jesus. Hallelujah. So this morning, that is our subject. And Jesus is already here. Hallelujah. Jesus is in this house today. You can see him. I can feel him. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels wings. I see glory on his face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Yeah. Hallelujah. Anything is possible now. If he's the bread of life, let him give life to those who are hungry. If he is the water of life, let him give water to those who are thirsty. If he's the healing of all nations, let him heal, Lord, those who are sick here this morning. It's, a, it's already here. Oh, hallelujah. I say it's here this morning. Uh, let me quickly add this one before I make a call. Let me just add this one for you. You know, when I preach many times, I preach many sermons in one. Amen. Because I'm getting older. And everything I have, I have to keep pouring it so that we can have it in our lives. Praise the Lord. Our focus is what? Jesus. I didn't hear you. Jesus. Say it louder. Jesus. What did the Greek say? What did the Greek say? All right, don't forget where I started. Bring back Jesus as a central focus. One. Second, we want to see Jesus. The third one, go to the priest. Not a lawgiver. Patronize the priest. Don't patronize the lawgiver from today. What do I mean by that? The priest is the one who has the mandate for salvation. To bless you. Your blessings in the mouth of the priest, not the lawgiver. A lot of people are running after lawgivers because they believe that when they hear them, their life is going to be shaped and reshaped. It's not about character modification. Look, to be born again is a transformation of inner man. It's a change from inside, not a change from outside. I, the day I was born again, it's like heaven on earth. I knew something happened in my life. Glory be to God. 
go to a place that is sponsored by priests or by lawgivers. You know why? The strength of the lawgiver is law. The strength of the priest is the finished work of Christ. The lawgiver is looking for obedience to the law. But the priest is looking for obedience to the faith. Go to the priest. Now, let me give you a story. I know my time is going. Right? If you go to lawgivers, ah, you are in trouble. If you meet a man who is a law teacher, you are in trouble. You know, many years ago, I was in that circle. Though things have changed, we thank God. There's a glory. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, things have changed now. Uh, it's a very nice place because people were saved. There, were, there was multiple revival, you know, crippled work. Under me there, I saw blind eyes open, my ministry in those days, you know. Um, because the glory of the law is still there, but the grace is much more. But the point I want to make is this. If you go to a law teacher, a law giver, it will size you based on law. Yeah. There's a story in Leviticus 27. Oh, go back home and read it. Leviticus 27. You know what it says? Now, they were to make, the, the Lord told Moses to tell the Israelites to make vows. Listen very carefully, to make vows. And the vows was based on the value of the person. I don't want to waste our time, but later go and read it. The value is based on your strength to perform. Can I say what I mean? Now, if you are 20 to 60 years, you pay 50 shekel as a male. You pay 30 shekel as a female if you are within that range of age. Because you are still very strong. Say very strong. You can perform. You have strength. So your value is based on your strength. Now, if you are between 5 years and 20 years of age, as a male, you pay 20 shekel. As a female, you pay 10 shekel. But if you're between zero and five years, you pay five shekel as a male and three as a female because male are stronger than the female. Am I right? So the stronger the man, the more shekel he pays. It's based on his strength to perform. So everybody has to go to Moses for valuation. This is Moses. He will look at you and say, you, what's your age? 55, right? You're a man? Say, yes, sir. I value you based on your strength. You pay 50 shekel. Yes, sir. The next one, what's your age? I'm less than, you know, I'm just within 20. Okay, it's all right. You must pay 20 shekel, you know, to the temple because I'm going to value you according to your strength to perform. Am I communicating? Yes, sir. Am I communicating? Yes, sir. Now, <laughs> but <laughs> some people are exempted from going to Moses. Why? Verse 8. Look at that chapter, verse, verse 8. But if he's too poor to pay your valuation. Now, get the, get the message. Moses is a lawgiver. He values you based on your performance. Huh? What you can do with your strength. That's how he, he will grade you. Are you following this? Man? Now, but the Bible now says, but if the man is too poor, Then he shall present himself before the priest. <laughs> Glory to God. And listen, and the priest shall set a value for him. According to the ability of him who vowed, the priest shall value him. And whatever the priest says, he stands. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Look at verse 12. Look at verse number 12. And the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad. As you, the priest, value it, so it shall be. In other words, those who came to Moses were valued based on their performance. Because law will judge you on your performance. You know when you look at a man, the law will say, "Are you holy? All right? 
Are you still smoking? It's based on your performance. He said, look, but if a man has nothing to present, oh God, oh God, oh God, you are so poor, you got nothing to present. He said, yes, in your own case, go to the priest. The priest has been authorized to value you and whatever the priest says about you, it stands. If the priest says you are perfect, you are perfect. If he says you are acceptable, you are acceptable. If he says you are good enough, you are good enough. If he says you are holy, you are holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't go to the lawgiver. He will judge you according to your performance, ability, and, being, and, and competence. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. For theirs is the kingdom rule of God. Your true value, hear me in church. Your true value is in the mouth of the priest, not in the mouth of the lawgiver. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are many verses I can read to you. Chapter 21 of Deuteronomy, verse 5. Let's quickly see some of these powerful scriptures. 21, Deuteronomy 21, verse 5. And what does it say? Then the priest, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of the Lord. By their word, every controversy, every assault shall be settled. By their word, every controversy settled. So the priests are given the power to bless, not based on your ability, not on your capacity, but blessed based on whatever he feels about you. Can I say that God likes you? Jesus loves you. Jesus says, I am the high priest. Oh, you are acceptable in me. I pay the price for your salvation. Law says, you're not good enough. And priest says, no, it's good enough. Hallelujah. I feel his hands in this house. You know, anytime I see the grace of God, I feel like crying. Because the world is waiting for performance. But the, Lord is, but the Lord is waiting for belief. It's not about behave, it's about belief. Matthew chapter 8, if you remember, those lepers that were cleansed, I have no time, chapter 8 from verse 1 to 4, those lepers that were cleansed by Christ. You know what Jesus Christ told them? He said, go to the priest and show yourself. That's normally a ritual the priest will perform. And after that, he will now declare them clean, clean, clean. He said, don't go to Moses. Oh. Moses will not believe that you are cleansed. You must go to who? The priest. And the priest will tell you, cleansed. Again, cleansed. Again, this morning, you are cleansed. This morning, I say, you are cleansed. But I hear the voice of a, I, listen, I hear the voice of a Pharisee in this church. One Pharisee is saying, uh-uh, Bishop, how do you say they are cleansed? And I hear Jesus saying to you, what I have cleansed, don't call unclean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The law will not accept you unto the congregation of the righteous, but the grace will accept you. So the teacher of the priest is to declare you clean. Some, I saw something, Pastor Phil, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 6. It surprised me. Number 21. Oh, yes. Verse 16. If you see that scripture, it talks of the well dug by the lawgiver. Israel drank from the well dug by the lawgiver. Gentlemen, stop drinking from the wells dug by the lawgiver. That's a better well. You don't have to dig it. And yet you will get water. Israel drank from the law that the lawgiver dug. Hallelujah. 
It's another well called the well of salvation. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3. There's another water called the living water. John chapter 4. That's where you're supposed to drink from. You know when Jesus met the woman in John chapter 4? You know, he said, ah, Jesus, you don't have anything to draw the water with. If the well is very deep, how can you get water from this well? You have no, 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 nothing to draw it. That's what law says. Law says it's too deep. You can't get the water. What do you want to do? Law is always telling you it's impossible. Hallelujah. The Lord is in this place. Law says you have nothing to draw the water from. Law says the well is too deep. But grace says, the water is free. Somebody shout hallelujah. Go to the priest. Say, go to the priest. Say, go to the priest. Not a lawgiver. In Numbers chapter 6, something surprised me. It surprised me, Pastor Phil. What is it? Numbers chapter 6, verse 22. It shocked me when I saw this revelation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying... Speak unto Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, What did this? The Lord bless you. And what? He didn't say amen to that. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Who declared the blessing? Was it Moses? God told Moses. Oh, 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 God. Why didn't God say, Moses, bless the people? I said, no, 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 you are a lawgiver. The blessing is in the mouth of the priest. Say, go to the priest. I'm not hearing you say, go to the priest. In Matthew 17, you know the story. Jesus on the mountain top. The vision came. The voice came. When Peter said, let's make three tabernacles here. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for who? Jesus. And the voice interrupted that kind of stupid suggestion. Say, shut up! This is my beloved son. In whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Hallelujah. No. Who then do we take instructions from? Is it the church of Moses? Of the church of Elijah? Of the church of Jesus? Do you know in many churches today, I'm sorry to say, they build three tabernacles in the church at the same time. This Sunday, Moses. Next Sunday, Elijah. The other Sunday, they're mixing it. And yet, Almighty said, This is my beloved son, in whom I will please. Hear you what? Him. Now, this morning, I want you to go to the priest. He's exposed to you. It's your high priest who has passed through the heavens. And this morning, I can, I can say that Jesus is in this place. When Jesus was going to the heavens, he was blessing the church. I have shown you this scripture before. Luke 24. I'm closing now. Luke 24, verse number 15. Quick, let's see. It. My time is already over. Luke 24, verse 50. What does he say? And he led them out as far as Bethany. That's Jesus after he rose from the grave. Are you with me, church? He led the people out of the city. And he lifted up his hands. What was he doing? That the high priest of our salvation. Blessing them. Then look at it. And the Bible now says, and it came to pass, while he blessed them, that it was parted from them and carried to where? What's the meaning of that? It was blessing them until he went. You're blessed. Your sins are forgiven. You are blessed. You are blessed. Your sins are forgiven. You are accepted in the beloved. You are blessed. Heaven is yours. You are not at last, but right now. 
you are he was blessing the church. What do you think Jesus' blessing will be? The blessings of the Lord, which you cannot keep, which he kept for us. You're going out, you're coming in, shall be blessed. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm introducing you to this man called Jesus. The Lamb of God that taketh the way what? I see God here this morning. You know, stop valuing yourself based on your character. Value yourself based on what Christ has finished. Don't look at yourself from the perspective of the law. Look at yourself from the perspective of grace. Heaven is not for those who are righteous and perfect. It's for the guilty that God pardoned. Is somebody with me here this morning? Lastly, let me just wrap up now by saying, I want everyone here this morning to be saved. Everyone here to be saved. That was the hard desire of, of Paul the Apostle. To have a desire that my people, Israel, should be saved. It was saying, I want them to be saved. Romans chapter 10. I'm closing right now. Just give me just five more minutes. Romans chapter 10. Hallelujah. Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I want beyond activity, beyond ceremony, that you should be saved. You must be saved. If you're not yet saved, you must be saved this morning. I'll, look at what hindered them. Look at, it, look, look at the next verse. For I bear them witness that they have zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Some people can play drums. Some people can do anything in the church. Some people are zealous, but the knowledge of the grace may not be there. I don't want anyone to hide under the atmosphere of we are a grace church. And yet, you are not saved. And you know you are not saved. My heart desires this morning that you are saved. And Paul was saying, my people Israel, and by extension to everyone, Salvation is very near. It's so far away. If you look at this scripture, you hear what perhaps that was their thinking. You are so close to being saved right now as I speak. You are so close to being saved right now. If you read the next verse of this Roman chapter, you just, just go on a little bit. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I know you know that one already. Let me show you the one that perhaps you don't know. For Christ, the next verse, the next verse, the next verse, the next verse. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does this thing shall be saved. But you cannot do all of them, so you cannot be saved. The next verse, quickly. And the Bible says, But the righteousness of faith, Israel, my people, salvation is very close. Closer than you think. The righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Don't say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven that, that is to bring Christ down from heaven. Don't think that we have to now go to heaven. Somebody has to go to heaven. Jesus, please come down. We are in sin. We are in chain. The devil is tormenting us. Come and save us. He said, no, that has been done. Yeah. Then the next verse, then as I read, he said, who will ascend into the abyss, who will descend to the habit? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Maybe you are thinking in your mind, oh yes, I know he died. He was buried. I wish you that he rose. Who will now go to that place and bring the Savior for us? Who will bring him to, for us and, so he can save us and, and, and pay the price? And the Bible says everything that you're asking for has been done. You don't have to go on pilgrimage to heaven to bring him down or to hell to bring him up. No, you don't have to do that. Hallelujah. It's hallelujah. 
both incarnation plus crucifixion and resurrection have been finished. Hallelujah. They have taken, let me tell you this morning how close you are to being saved. Do you know how close you are? Can I tell you? Paul said, the word is near you. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. So salvation is already in your mouth and also in your word. Ha. So don't think it's so far away. It's not far away. You're asking me, Bishop, how did salvation get to my mouth? And got in, into my heart. How did it, how, how, how did Jesus, I put it there. When? Now. How? By the word of faith that will preach unto you. The word of faith that will preach unto you is what puts salvation in your mouth. And also in your heart. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. What do you do with what is in your mouth? And what is in your heart? What do you do? The Bible says it. If thou shalt what? Read it, read it, read it. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That's how the word got into you. Now the next verse says, and what does it say? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Say. Why? Verse 10. For with the heart, man believes unto what? Righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto what? Salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever shall call on him shall be saved. So, sisters and brothers, this morning, salvation is closer to you than you ever think. Do you have mouth? Do you have heart? And the word is there right now. Anyone who is here, not saved this morning, heaven is open for you to get saved. All eyes closed. All eyes bow. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody is here this morning that needs to be saved. Needs to be converted. We're going to pray for you. Don't, don't worry. We're going to pray for you. But this, let's settle this issue of salvation. My heart desires that everybody who steps in here shall be saved. Jesus is closer. You don't need to do anything to get saved. The word is in your mouth. And the word is in your heart. Speak with your mouth. Believe in your heart. All eyes closed. I mean it. And all heads bowed. Put it down a little bit. Put it down a little bit. Down. If you're here this morning, by saying, Bishop, I know what I am. I know I'm zealous. I know I'm religious. But I'm not born again. I know it. And you want me to bring you close face to face with Jesus this morning and get saved. The Lord is here. Right here. Right where you are seated. Just lift your hands above your head. I'm waiting for you, please. Thank you. Lift your hands above your head. Hi. Say, Bishop, I want to be saved. Since it's so close to me, I don't want to miss this privilege because I have no control over my life. Can I see the hands raised up? Raise it up very high. Stand on your feet. Walk to the altar here. In the name of Jesus. Just come here. I want to shake your hands and pray with you right now. Please come, come, come. I see the hands. Please don't be ashamed. Just come. Just come forward. Come forward. Come, come, come. I prayed for you before I came. Come. What are you? Please. You want to get saved this morning. Ten people are here that must be saved. Because your life is in danger if you miss this privilege. Come. Clap for them as they are coming, please. Come and clap as they are coming. Clap for them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. 